Um, so I will be presenting about uh, Reprex Pi. So Reprex is a Python package that's derived from R, um, which gives reproducible examples, or uh, as they call it, minimum workable examples. And the reason why we need it is um, when code is written in the Python console or in Jupyter Notebook or wherever, um, it includes special characters like this, or it'll have outputs where you know the output is not um, it's it's not commented. So when you copy paste it, and you know if you have to share it to someone, then it's not it gives errors like this. So people cannot reproduce the code that you um, have used. So and it's it's hard to copy each line and and do it, especially if the code is really long. So the um, that's why we have this package. And um, so the main idea is that um, it uses PyQt, PyperClip, and session info uh, in the background. And it's um, you copy the code um, into your clipboard, which is uh, which is what happens in general. And then PyperClip is another package that helps retrieve uh, the code from the location of the uh, clipboard and then copies it from there and then it's given to Reprex and then that gives um, the minimum workable example that you can share in any kind of forum. Um, so I have already installed this package. Um, it's just it's a regular uh, pip install um, and I recommend using the stable version. And so for the demo, can you see? Yeah, we can see this. Okay, okay. So let me open up Python. Um, another heads up, um, there's a problem with um, running this uh, package on Colab because Colab cannot access um, your clipboard because it, Colab is not programmed in such a way that it can go into your local systems clipboard and access it. And there's also some problem with uh, running it on JHPC. So that's why I'm running it on my system. They said that they use um, CentOS and not Ubuntu, and this requires everything in the background requires Ubuntu. So I'm just running it on my local system right now. Um, because I've run it so many times that I you just import the package. And then... Um, they have me. So if I have to show a plot, so I just copied the code. Um, I'm running Reprex. And I don't have to copy this because it already uh, copies the code that I need to paste on my clipboard. So if I have to post it on, on a Slack channel, just paste it. It also shows the plots over here. It also has links to the plot. So you can see the plots. And there's also everything is commented off so people can actually use this example um, to be reproducible. Or you can even post it on, um, on GitHub. And when you click on preview, it creates a very clean example that you can um, share. And this makes it easier for people to understand. I'm really sorry about the barking, uh, but this makes it easier for people to understand. The example, um, if there is an error in the code, for example, they also have an example for this. Yeah. 
So the all the error is also commented out so people can actually reproduce this example and just copy paste it into their console or uh, wherever they want to copy into and this is they can help you with the errors whenever it's required so this is the main advantage of having uh, reprex by i'm sure it's already been used in r um but the and, and also um if you cannot um, copy the code from the clipboard, then you can also do, you can also put the code over here in a code file. So I already created um, a test code file, which is, oops, okay. It's it's a very simple example. Um, so this test file is on my system and you can put the file path and then it gives you the reproducible code that you can again and the output is commented out so you can reproduce this example and yeah this is a very helpful but a simple package that you can use to share code with people and help and people can help you with the you know your errors and everything Um, yeah, so now we can like move into a section where um, I guess the theme here is we're talking about packages that maybe are either in R or um, inspired by stuff we've done in R and have like corresponding Python um, analogs, I guess. So um, the first one we can talk about is Pi here. So actually, I have the um, the documentation up for the R version. Um, I think we've presented on this before. Um, so. Maybe some of this will be review, but just like a quick overview is like, um, we'll start with the R version actually. Uh, so the quick overview is like, it's a, here is a R package to manage um, paths um, where basically paths are defined relative to a top level of, of a project. Um, and so, um, if you have, if you go anywhere inside of like your, your project, I think, let me see where they have a good example of this, but, um, or maybe, maybe I'll show the Python version. But essentially you have like, you're in some sort of project where there's a top level directory and you define paths relative to that. And um, I guess you could compare that to two different alternatives. You could use absolute paths. Um, which are generally bad because like if anything moves, all of a sudden everything breaks in your project in terms of paths at least. Um, you could also do relative paths, um, which are movable, but one disadvantage is if you have a pretty like convoluted directory structure in the, in a big project, um, any script would have to use like a bunch of, if you're defining paths relatively, you might have to do like a dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, you know, whatever um, the path is to do things relative, and that's not as readable. Um, so those are like maybe the reasons why you might consider here. Over I'll, I'll add another one, yeah. like relative paths, you have to run them from where they're supposed to be run. Yes, Whereas yeah. here, you can run it anywhere in your, in your project mm -hmm. at any like level of, uh, like you could be like three directories in, yeah. and it's still gonna give you the same path. Yeah, you don't have to worry about precisely where you started your scripts um, or what the working director is precisely at least. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, so yeah, we have the R version of this. And since we use it so often in R, I figured like, I'll just talk about um, the Python version, which is mostly the same, I'll admit, but um, a bit different. So um, it's just called Pi here, first of all. That's one of the main differences. Um, and I guess they, they actually have a better example of what it looks like in your code, which is actually identical to R. Um, so they have two different alternatives for like um, showing the relative directory up here. And I don't think they actually mention it, but typically the first one is like preferred um, because it's sort of like operating system independent. Um, it like Windows, I think, uses backslashes. Uh, so it's generally recommended to separate things like this. Um, and as for just briefly discussing how it finds the project route, 
Um, it's a little bit, the Pi here version is a bit different than R, but mostly the same. Um, one of the main things that I use it for, at least that works well, is um, for Git repos. So just, if you're anywhere inside a Git repo, it'll like search upward until it finds the dot Git directory. And it's like, okay, well, that's the head, of, that's the uh, root project. Um, but it also has other indicators. And I think you can even change what indicators it uses. Although, um, I don't know how useful that'd be. Um, uh, and also like for Python projects where you have like a set of dependencies and a requirements.txt file, just a bunch of common things you might have on top of the project. And then alternatively, if you don't have any of those files in your project, but you still want to use the package, you can always just create a dot here file at the top. Um, so yeah, it's a fairly straightforward package. Um, I will, will dive into some code, I guess. Um, so let me open up. It's gonna be a little messy on the screen. Um, I provided a script I'm using in like the repo, which I linked in the Google Doc. Um, so I think I have, uh, uh, I have it cloned in this directory here. Um, so let me just open up that code here, I'm doing this all in a cluster. Um, so I have a, um, you can actually open Python scripts in RStudio, um, which might be preferred. I use Sublime, but um, let's open this up. Um, and just, we'll get an interpreter going. Um, normally, if you have like your own laptop, there's like cleaner ways to integrate like your, um, the script in like a terminal, like you have a whole development environment. Um, but for now, I'm just going to be having like using the command line and then just a text editor. Um, so I won't go too much into the reasoning behind this, but basically, like often we'll have like a bunch of Python tools and modules, and that's how I tend to access like a set of Python um, packages that I'm familiar with. So I'm just going to load one that I know has the required. Um, Python dependencies, I'm open up a Python interpreter. Um, and for now, I'm just going to copy and paste. For, for this example, we're going to be doing like a small task that just like maybe like a small practical problem where we can use the here package. And also, we'll touch a bit on just different Python concepts that happen to come up. Um, that might be interesting for people who are more familiar with R. Um, Sorry for interrupting. I am not able to. Could you increase the size of your R Studio? Oh, yes. Sorry, I was going to do that. Um, Thank you. Um, um, yeah, so what we're going to import the packages. Actually, these take a while, so I should have started this earlier. But um, we'll be using ScanPy for actually just, in this case, really just the um, example data. Um, we're going to be loading a public data set of um, an AND data object, which we talked about before. It's basically like summarized experiment Python. Um, this is just going to be so, the, like, the example task we'll be doing is we're going to be just taking one sample of, of this experiment um, and we're just going to be looking for what the, mito, the ensemble IDs for the mitochondrial genes measured in the experiment are. Um, not necessarily something you would like. Just to like show how to how these packages work. Um, we'll also be talking about session info at the end. Um, so I should bring that up. Like we're familiar, or some of us are familiar with session info in R. And so like this is a package I think is pretty similar to uh, um, that the one we used R. Um, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but first, um, I'll mention that you can um, just see like where the project root is by just calling the here function with no arguments. Um, so in this case, I it's actually the same as the working directory. Um, at the, this is a the name of the Git repo. So we're inside a Git repo. And that's that's why it found that, not because it's the working directory. Um, you know, before I, before importing these packages, I should have uh, um, actually let me just do it real quick. So I just want to show that like. Um, if you're inside of, it doesn't matter where you are inside the project, you can 
run the thing. Um, and then if you do, uh, um, this is actually, um, so it's a bit different in that it actually will see where you are and then, um, it's a bit convoluted here, but basically it is finding the same directory that is the root of the uh, repo. And um, I should mention also, you read for this package. Um, I guess I can't type while doing this, but uh, some functions, if you're passing like a path to a function, often it will expect a string and technically the object here is like a POSIX path. And sometimes you'll get some incompatibility with that, but it's not um, too much of a problem. You just cast it to a string. Um, and then you get something that works as a path, just as a string. Um, but anyway, we'll define the output path. Um, so relative to the project root, we have this folder called, called our set by here, and in the data, we'll place our output list of mitochondrial genes. That's what it looks like here. Um, um, I guess we do have time, so I will touch on each of these lines. So there's this package called pathlib that um, is often used to do just like path-related functions. So here, I'm just making sure the output directory exists where the, we're going to place this file. So pathlib is like a common um, library for stuff like this. So uh, just gonna make sure it exists. Should all right, let's load our example data. Uh, and you know, I probably should have done this from our studio, so I could just like control enter or whatever these points of code. Now I'm thinking about it, um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, again, I mentioned this is like these end data are essentially just uh, summarized experiments where we have some observations and variables which are like rows and columns and are um, the obvious like the observations are um, let's see they're columns and um, this is sort of like call data I guess um, and the variables are um, like row data. And then we have other things like unstructured, which is kind of like metadata summarized experiment. But anyway, that's just like a brief view. Um, in this case, like for the simple task we're doing, we're just gonna like again, we're finding mitochondrial genes that are measured in the experiment, just as a, a thing to do. Um, and uh, so um, basically, in this case, the object has it in the bar names, which are like row names, essentially. We have all the gene symbols. Um, so we know that mitochondrial genes just start with um, MT dash. Um, so we'll, we're going to be using that to find which ones are mitochondrial genes. Um, and here's something you might see in Python that might be unfamiliar if you use R a lot. Um, this section of code is it's called list comprehension. Um, but so basically what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be saying like we're going to be looping through um, every element and these, um, these these symbols we're going to call each of them a symbol so for each, each gene symbol and these um, row names essentially we're going to include it in this list which is the same as the list R essentially um, and we're going to include it if it starts with um, MT dash so just this is just forming a list of the symbols for the mitochondrial um, genes. So here we are, we have a list. Um, and if our task is to print the ensemble IDs, um, we, we will get the corresponding ensemble IDs. Um, and then this is actually, so internally, these andate objects are use a lot of um, pandas data frames. So that's sort of like the go to data frame in Python. Um, Python really uses a lot of pandas, it's almost like tidyverse I'd compare it to in R. Um, so here we have a pandas data frame and the index, which is basically like the names um, or row names, I guess. Um, 
as the symbols, but we want the values. Um, so we're going to use um, dot log to index these by the, the symbols. Um, so we're going to take the values where the index are equal to these symbols. So that's just like, like this, which is another kind of data frame. Um, and just to write this to an output, we're going to convert that to a list. Um, so Pandas <coughs> does have functions for like writing to files very conveniently. Um, so I do want to mention that like there's like write CSV or plenty of other variants that are useful. In this case, I'll be just be using base Python um, stuff just because we'll write like a list with one, um, or sorry, a text file with like one gene per line. Um, but we could have just written this as a CSV, for example. Um, so yeah, now we have our ensemble IDs. Um, so in base Python, like the canonical way to work with files is you will use a with statement. So like you have a bunch of stuff you do with a file inside of it. And previously, like it was recommended to actually explicitly open a file, do something, and then explicitly close it. But this is like a way to make sure that you don't mess up something with the file handles. Um, so use a with statement. So we're gonna be opening um, this path. We're gonna be writing to it. Um, and then we're just gonna use the base Python function for write lines. Um, and for some reason, the default is not to include a new line when you're writing a list. So we have to explicitly add the new lines. So that's what this like kind of confusing section is. Um, so we would just run this. Um, and then now we have a text file with one line for a gene. Um, so yeah, short like example analysis with Python, and we use Py here to reference the path. Um, so I guess we can take a look at the file. It's not too, I mean, it's not interesting. It is what I said, basically. So we have a project root, um, and we're just following this directory structure, moving to the data folder, and we have this, um, yeah, this text file. Um, it's really small, but yeah, this is our result. Um, so yeah, we got a little bit of everything here, but um, next thing is that we have this session info package. Um, again, this is, there's like not much to this. It's just useful to know maybe about a port of this that we use as we often are. Um, if you're using it interactively, basically you, you call this function. Um, I could have also, um, I guess I should briefly explain like for pi here, we did from pi here import here. So that's what, if you don't want to type the whole, if you just did import pi here, you could rec, you could um, find this function by saying pi here dot here. But if you want to just call a function name, sort of to make it familiar, like we do in R, you can explicitly import just this particular function. So with session info, we could have actually done the same thing. We could have done from session info import show, but that's a little ambiguous. Like if you just had a show function, like that's not, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's confusing. So that's why we did use two different methods here. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, this, this is pretty straightforward, not much to show here, but um, uh, first I wanna say we use the HTML equals false option because I think for some reason it thinks it's, we're in a, um, I think I messed up something up with the <laughs> installation of like Jupyter notebooks, um, but it thinks we're, I don't think you normally have to provide this when you're just doing the terminal. But anyways, um, we print the pa packages that we've explicitly imported. That's all it does by default. And if you're in a Jupyter notebook, it prints other stuff. We're not, I'm not actually sure why it's doing this here, but um, there's, if you want to show like a more thorough list, like we're used to in R, you can do dependencies equal true. And then we get all the packages that we relied on under the hood. Um, I mentioned pandas, which we didn't explicitly import, but you can find it um, down here as the version and all that. So um, that's probably the way I'd imagine most of us will run this function. Um, so yeah, not much to this. Um, I will, yeah. Uh, can you get it to show where um, the dependencies are located at, like on the disk? Where they're located. Um, I'm like uh, with R in session if uh, at the end of it, you get uh, the library paths in R. I don't know if you can get that here. 
Um, so I just have to get out files. Um, just to briefly explain that, not to go on a tangent or anything, but like, or you could do the question mark function in Python, you just do help and then the function name. Anyways, um, did I even open the right thing? That was weird. I didn't really show me. What did I do wrong here? Um, well, maybe show is calling something else. I think you actually read the function, not the. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. You're not supposed to include uh, parentheses. So that was actually invoking the function, not what we wanted to do. Um, so you're asking if we could show the um, like the paths to. Um, not that I, know. I think you you passed it fast. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember seeing that when I was going through this package. Um, yeah, so maybe maybe it's a bit less thorough, I guess, in some sense than the ARM version. Um, so yeah, not that I know, but it doesn't look like here that there's that option. Um, what is what is private doing? Uh, Show information for private modules. I believe that's like if you import your own Python scripts. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't tested that. That's a good question. Um, it's yeah. the standard lib. That wouldn't be it. What happens if the HTML um, is set to true? Um, we can try that. Okay. Uh, it's assuming you're in a Jupyter notebook environment. Oh, okay. okay. Um, that's what it's oh, designed. Yeah. You guys are so, like, I feel really old, okay? Because uh, when I first started, we had no, this didn't exist. This is a 2021 package. So I had to just, MacGyver, there's a Slack, a Slack, re, a, um, not Slack, a, a, a stack flow, uh, that explains how you can get some of these detail and then they made this package so there's a lot of like community discussion on how this this package came about because it's like three it uses like two other somewhat Jupyter notebook specific packages as well as a guidance from like the community to develop at uh, so it's still so I think probably if they person can is like this person did it as like as like a uh, kind of just a side project. Uh, so like if we wanted to continue doing, making it better then yeah, I think getting the the list of the libraries would be good, but man, it makes me feel so old. You're like, oh, there's nothing to it. It's like, this took so many years <laughs> to develop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've like seen alternatives with like crazy list comprehension of like how to, because there's like some built-in functions that you can get some of this information, but yeah, it's like super convoluted. I remember mean, some alternatives to this. Uh, yeah, this is very much welcome. Um, and yeah, we can like talk to, we can maybe briefly talk to other people. Yeah, so like, saying like it's a, it's like Python, HTML, so it's assuming we're using IPython and doing yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so I could actually, I mean, we, we, I'll just briefly show. Uh, we could just open up a um, collab notebook, or just go to collab, open up, and then do a notebook, just start a new one. Um, so we don't actually have this, um, it's not included in one of the base packages used here, so we're going to use this. Um, so yeah, you can run like shell commands. This is basically like interactive. I think JJ's talked about it before, but um, yeah, this is a Jupyter notebook. So install packages that aren't there, you use pip. We're just using like a shell commands, which starts with the shebang. Um, so yeah, do that. Um, let's import this and then we can import another package to show it. Um, I don't know, pandas. I think it should be included here. Um, so we'll import those two packages. Actually, let me just put it right here since it's going to be quick. Um, dot 
show. Um, and actually, by default, it will do the HTML thing. Yeah, so it gives this little nice snippet um, that works well in, in notebooks. So it's, these can get really long, so you can just like, um, yeah, it's just like a small convenience 